Good morning and welcome to this Saturday morning's Fife Properties show. Now, single lets or HMOs is our topic this morning, Kern. And could you profit uh, jump 50% when you do a multiple occupancy let, which is an HMO? So how's the multiple occupancy for people that don't know what an HMO is? Um, so if you're looking for ways to boost your buy to let uh, profits, converting your rental home, if it's big enough, to a house of multiple occupancy or an HMO uh, for short could maybe be the answer. So HMOs have, they have taken off a little bit and exploded in popularity as an option for landlords to increase their income by letting out the property as individual rooms as opposed to the whole property uh, as a whole. Uh, for instance, a four bedroom, two living room, family house with two working parents and three children could become a six room HMO with six individual incomes coming in for each room. So is this something that we see? I mean, Fife in itself, I mean, HMOs are quite popular in St Andrews and things, Kim. We've, uh, I recently just listed one which had its HMO licence. It didn't make the uh, deadline for this year, so they're now obviously exploring long -term, longer term residential and we've been inundated with students. I was going to say, yes, the amount of students that we've had inquiring about that one. So, uh, yeah, it's making sure a property, for a start, has its HMO licence if you are looking for that type of property. And I think this is good to cover what a HMO actually is. Because, um, I mean, we can put on it, that one, for instance, it states no HMO licence, but the amount of students that we have inquiring for it still that just don't understand. I know, I was quite specific in that one. And it's in the list, and I've done the video walk around for it, and it explicitly says in the intro that there is no HMO license. I think I mentioned it as a walk around as well. And I also said it at the end again, but unfortunately we still get the inquiries for it. So um, yeah, it's quite good to run through. <laughs> yeah, it's quite good to run through exactly what an HMO is and the benefits of that. And we're going to look at the um, the downsides as well. Um, so, I mean, when asked by the Times, uh, brokerage mortgages for business uh, put average yields, yields of HMOs at 7.5%. Now, that's about a 50% leap from the 5% average of renting maybe a single family home. Now, they, these averages are for the UK. I know it's quite different if, if you break it down by area and, and Fife and things as well. But there is obviously a significant increase. However, complex regulations, the extra management means HMOs aren't for every landlord uh, and they aren't suitable for every property either. So with that in mind, we've put together today's blog and we're going to talk uh, you through that and some find together, try and find some kind of balance. And we're going to look at the overviews of HMOs. We're going to look at the benefits, as I said, of HMOs in comparison to maybe an individual let. HMO licensing and planning laws, which are so important. The downsides of HMOs and um, extra HMO operating costs. Of course, there is operating costs of that additional to doing just your uh, standard long-term residential uh, lets. So if you're wondering whether the world of HMOs is right for you, then I think you're in the right place this morning and we're going to go through that as best we can. Uh, we were just touching on HMOs. It, it, Ken, we don't deal with HMOs. We are just solely long-term residential lets, but it can be quite lucrative, and especially in areas where there's students and things as well. So let's have a wee, I'll, I'll run through a wee bit an overview of HMOs. And HMO, as I said, is a house of multiple occupancy. And it's defined as a residential property let to three or more adults. So we've got the private residential tenancy here in Scotland, and you can only have two adults on that. Um, if there's three or more, then it obviously becomes a, an HMO. Um, and three or more adults who rent a room individually, they share a toilet, bathroom, and kitchen facilities. Okay. It's quite good that we've just listed this one because I could use it as a good comparison because in this one yeah. we have five bedrooms we've got two kitchens so there's one on the top floor it's a three-story townhouse just so you uh, can be uh, just so you can visualize what we're, we're referring to so there's a kitchen on the top floor kitchen on the ground floor there's a reception room there's a bathroom on the split level and then on the first floor for the three bedrooms there's a shower room as well did I get that right Kim? Yeah, so you've got you come in and we've got our, our initial reception room with the kitchen leading out to the garden. We come up to the split level where we've got family, typically would be your family bathroom. Yep. Then you've got your three bedrooms with the shower room. And then on the top floor, you've got two bedrooms and the kitchen as well. And so an additional kitchen. Yeah. yeah. 
And so that is an ideal setup for an HMO. Uh, and as I say, it previously was, but we're doing it as residential now. So, but the best HMOs are near maybe major employment centres, uh, business districts, uh, retail parks, hospitals, and of course, obviously students, uh, universities and student accommodation. Um, high demand is really key if you're going to have an HMO. You need to have like, and again, St Andrews is a great example, because as soon as you do um, a listing for a property like that in that area, you're in indeed with students because, I mean, there's just such a high demand. Um, but it's not as simple as buying just a large house anywhere. Obviously, bedrooms uh, for adults in the licence for HMOs must be at least 6.51 metres squared. That's for one person. And 10.22 metres squared for two. Um, and there should be a communal bathroom for every four tenants. So there's a lot of things to think about there. You can't just think, oh, I'll buy a house with four bedrooms. And do you know what I mean? You need to make sure the sizing and what you're including in that and what facilities they have. Um, and while you can dispense with a shared living area, a living room, you must provide communal spaces for cooking and eating. And they need to be starting at 17 metres squared for four for a four person HMO and rising up from there. So there is quite a lot involved in the HMO licensing. You do need to adhere to quite a lot of uh, things and make sure sizing and that is, is really important. And, and I think as well, and, and looking at the overview of HMOs, finally, you, you need to have each tenant should have their own um, copy of the tenancy agreement covering um, what is included in the property. Um, and you also need to obviously be correct in what you're taking deposits uh, to protect them in the way of um, the deposits, uh, security deposit on the property and things as well. So you need to make sure that's all done correctly. We, of course, have the private residential tenancy here in Scotland. In England, Wales, that is different. Um, I have spoke to a few agents who operate HMOs in St Andrews and things, and they are not as optimistic about how the PRT works with lettings for an HMO. In fact, they find it very difficult and they find it they don't find it's a suitable um, document to use. I mean, obviously it's a place and they use it, but it does throw up quite a lot of issues for them. Whereas when we do longer term residentials, I mean, there, there is changes from the short assured tenancy, but we tend to find that it does still work. We've yeah, there's a, I can see it. It's very much tailored to like what we do, like residential lets, long term lets for that side of it. And I can see where there would be some flaws in the system when it comes to HMOs, because you do have that every tenant is effectively their own tenancy, as opposed to when we're doing it, it's either a single, a sole tenancy or a joint tenancy. Yeah. So um, obviously it does make it a bit different when it comes to drawing up the lease for it. It's not just a lease with five people's names on it, for example, it's effectively five different leases that you're having to put in place when it comes to a HMO. Yeah, it, it, it's quite challenging, I have to say, and I've, I've heard that from people that do it um, on a daily basis. So um, yes, that, there is some um, there is some downsides which we'll cover, but I was going to ask you, Karen, do you want to maybe cover some benefits and things, and HMO benefits, in comparison to what we do as a long-term single-let residentials? Yeah, so obviously there's a diff very much a difference between the two. So with rents going up, tenants are having to adjust their expectations as to what they'll get for their money. And obviously when open when it opens up to new advantages for landlords. So HMOs, it does bring in some different benefits as opposed to doing long-term lets, short-term lets, whatever yeah. suits yourselves. So it's an excellent market in for high quality HMOs that gives them that would give you more income per room while giving a tenant a lower cost for renting an entire room. So ultimately, yeah. when it comes to HMOs, you're effectively getting a bit more for your money for a tenant, potentially because you are renting a room as opposed to having to potentially get yourself a one bed apartment or a two bedroom apartment. You can just utilize yourself to that one room. So obviously it does give the landlord different benefits for that side. But it's quite a good point you made there as well, because you're, you're saying obviously it gives the tenant a lower cost than renting an, an entire home. And we'll go back to St Andrews again, because obviously we're in Fife and HMOs draws me straight to St Andrews, obviously. The the tenant, now what we're saying for a room in St Andrews just now, five, six hundred pounds possibly. Um, now you're not going to get a house or a, or, a, or, a, or a flat or apartment at that level, you're, and especially not in St Andrews. So 
I think if you're getting it at the five, six hundred pounds per room, you've got everything included, you've got your facilities and things as well. That's going to work out a lot more cost effective for a student coming to study in St Andrews than trying to find a home um, or, a, or an apartment or a flat just to accommodate them for the semester. So that's that is a really good point you made there. And in turn, it obviously it will benefit the landlord as well, because while it's a lower rent for potentially one tenant, when you have multiple rooms, all those lower rents all amount up. So you can make quite a good return on it between all the rooms adding up together. And also yeah. as well, it makes it for a virtually non-existent risk of your property sitting unoccupied as well. Because if you are letting the property on an individual basis effectively per room, then you're going to have more of a consistent turnover as opposed to having one tenancy that moves out and you're having to find another one. You tend to have that more consistent flow of tenants for it when they are on a room to room basis. Yeah, definitely. I think if you are to say, for instance, you've got maybe contractors and things in there and, and they're not all on the same contract or the same, same job or, um, do you know, they're going to be coming and going at different times whenever their jobs finish and things. So you're, you're always going to have um, some level of occupancy. I know that there's an issue uh, with some people, like with the unis and things, if people are coming here from overseas to do semester um, at the uni, then they all leave at the same time and all come back at the same time. So you've got that you've got that vacant uh, void period where the property ends up empty. Whereas if you've got a continual flow of maybe different contractors and even students in a mix of things, then that could keep your occupancy um, higher than what it, what it would be if you're just relying solely maybe on students coming in from I think it's, it's September, September to and mm -hmm. um, yeah so like the, for that kind of semester period so yeah that's the uh, that's a good point. But the thing with it as well is obviously with the change in occupancy it does mean there's an opportunity for more frequent frequent rent reviews as tenants come and go so it means your income and yield can increase more often than with a single let. Yeah that's a good point because you can you can obviously then realign um, rental amounts in between tenancies and, and new contracts being drawn up so yeah and for a landlord as well we find that many hmo landlords operate through a limited company so they can deduct 100 percent of their mortgage interest rate from the profits before paying tax so it does make for a considerable saving yeah so that's obviously tax deductible yeah so that's another thing yeah so yeah there is there is, there is a quite a few benefits to doing that especially from a, a monetary aspect and and being quite a lucrative venture so it's not surprising that people are considering if they've got the right property to consider that as an avenue just with the way things have changed and and the the, um, the current climate and the private rental sector at the moment people are trying trying to explore different options and think a wee bit more outside the box of what, the, what they're doing and if you've got a property that's suitable for HMOs and maybe you have a really good agent who operates with HMOs or you or you do that yourself and um, as an option to look at in terms of generating maybe more profits, as we say, could you push that up uh, to even 50% more than what you had as a single let? But to do that, you need to think about the licensing. So HMO licensing, planning and safety laws and things are a really big thing. Um, the law of, for HMOs can feel um, a bit inconsistent between national and local authority policies because they do change slightly. But uh, here are some of the main regulations that you will encounter. Now, as I say, as we go across the country, these will slightly differ between local authorities and things. But um, planning classes are divided into C4, which covers small HMOs uh, of three to six people. Um, and Sue's Generous, uh, which covers large HMOs of seven and more. So that's obviously bigger properties. Um, so there is obviously the, the different levels where you've got a smaller property which operates only with uh, maybe a few people, obviously three to six, and then you've got bigger properties which would uh, be seven or more. So that's quite a that's quite a considerable size property because even the one we're referring to in St Andrews wouldn't be seven or more people. That's only got five rooms and that's quite a big property. So you could imagine obviously that um, it would be quite a big property to house seven or more. A license uh, generally is valid for five years and is mandatory for an HMO uh, to let to five or more tenants and some local authorities require smaller HMOs to be licensed as well. So like I say, it will change and differ between the local authorities. If it's a smaller HMO, some local authorities might not 
need the license in place, but it just depends. Obviously, that will change completely as you go across uh, the country. And the one for me, which I know is obviously different from what we do in a longer term residential, is fire safety requirements. And the one of the main things is obviously main power uh, fire alarms, which we have anyway in long term residentials. But you also have to have extinguishers on each floor and um, you need to have obviously the proper smoke alarms. Fire doors are something that you need as well. Um, and they need to close. Uh, the fire doors need to close obviously on their own uh, on each unit. So that's like each individual unit has to have one. Uh, and you have to have clear escape routes marked as well with exit signs and things as well. So yeah, so there's a lot of safety regulations that do come in out with just I mean for a rental property in general, there's a lot of safety regulations that we have to have in place for any let. Might as well when it comes to HMO, there are a lot more that has to be taken into consideration. I know obviously the fire doors are always the main one that I think of. Smoke alarms to us just comes naturally anyway, but um, obviously the fire doors here, when you're doing viewings at that one, it's <laughs> got a door slamming at the back of you. So we're trying to find bits of cardboard to wedge them all open while you're doing the viewings. Yeah, well, we've done that. Yeah, and also for doing the video and walk around and things as well, because obviously all the fire doors need to, they're self-closing and they're quite heavy as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, as I say, obviously things change between local authorities, and but most local authorities, uh, may not require you to have a planning application to convert your home into an HMO of up to six tenants, uh, but some do, uh, which then gives neighbours a chance to object. And we hear a lot of that. Um, recently, I've heard a lot of that, obviously, and over the years, St Andrews has got a lot of issues with that, with the residents opposing to having HMOs next door to them. And in some cases, quite rightly so, I mean, students can be quite noisy and things, but then you do have, um, you don't want to discriminate because there's a lot of really good st students who are here to obviously study and have fun. Obviously, everybody wants to have fun, but there's a lot of mature students and things as well and postgrads and things that, um, I mean, that really then obviously leaves them limited with accommodation and things as well. But if you need to put the application through for approval, local residents and things do have their say. And that could be that could be a bit of a stumbling block for you as well. But uh, given the rules for an HMO in a new area, it may differ for those elsewhere. So it's a wise it's a wise move to check with the relevant council's website. So if you if you're in Fife Council, go on the Fife Council website. If you're in uh, Rovia, so you're in Dundee, check um, the council's website before you invest in buying and converting a property and and, and investing your money into that, because um, you might then find that uh, the actual uh, licensing to convert it might not get approved and things so please do your due, due diligence on that i mean it's very important because you could then obviously then be quite out of pocket for yeah. we've uh, seen such a clamp down on each yeah. we've seen such a clamp down on hmos as well obviously like the one that we've got obviously licensing is not as easily obtainable anymore so if you are considering going into to purchasing a hmo make sure you can actually get the licensing for it if it's not already in place because then if not you're going to end up with a very large house and having to find, try and find a family for example to go into it. Yeah, yeah and, and the the uh, rental level will not be the, the return and rental level will not be the same as doing the individual rooms so um, and that's exactly how we ended up with the, this one recently it was an HMO previously but it doesn't have its license in place again um, so they've had to then go the other way and look at the option of a uh, longer term residential so and so obviously for our, ourselves as well it's a good way for us to deal with it because ultimately although we won't be able to put multiple tenants in, in the style of a hmo if it's not a joint tenancy there is the route of like a company let as well to explore yeah. so there's different avenues to venture down if you can't get a hmo license but obviously taking it into account don't buy a property that's suited for a HMO if you're not going to get a license for it. <laughs> yeah I mean if you make that plan to right I'm going to buy this property I'm going to and if you start investing a lot of money and making it compliant with fire doors and things that are going to be quite costly and it's like oh but you can't do that you can't convert it and if you kind of do an HMO in there or you don't get the license or whatever you, you're going to be severely out of pocket so that's really something to think about. Uh, now Karen, you covered some of the benefits of HMOs what about the drawbacks? 
So there are plenty of positives to owning a HMO, but there are some drawbacks as well. So you have to bear these in mind. So they may not be deal breakers for you, but it's best to keep the surprises to a minimum. There can be enough surprises when it comes to dealing with rentals. So <laughs> making sure that you know all the ins and outs beforehand at least will minimise some of them. So while one of the one of the drawbacks for it is there are fewer insurance and mortgage providers for HMOs. So this means less choice and potentially higher costs as well. However, you could save some money with a portfolio of products for multiple properties. Yeah, that's an important part as well. Yeah, obviously um, insurers and mortgage lenders and things. So make sure you have a really good um, mortgage broker and insurance lender and things and that on hand to advise you whether the a potential purchase or if you've got a property and you want to then convert it into an HMO, obviously you're, you're shaking it. You, you can convert it and you'll get the license, but you also want to check that um, your mortgage is going to be correct and you can get the correct funding and things to keep that going and running and also ensure it properly as a house of multiple occupancy. And um, you, you'll have a really need to have a good mortgage broker and insurance lender and things in place to find you the best products for that. And obviously when it does come to the point if you wish to sell the property, your sale price may be lower if you've installed fire lobbies and doors as a buyer might want to remove them and reinstate the property to its original single home look. So oh. ultimately, fire door is practical. Not always the nicest to look at though. Well, so. It's just that it's the flip side of obviously be careful about putting them in and then not being able to operate it like that because then you'll, you'll have obviously had that outlay for no, for no reason. But then obviously if you've got them in place, then you need to think about obviously then when you're selling, people are going to think the exact same, like this is going to cost me a lot of money to take them out. If, I mean, the, uh, the property we have just recently, which is an HMO, it would be a, an amazing family home. It would be a beautiful family home right in the centre of St Andrews, but it is set up uh, from a previous HMO. So there's a lot of changes you would have to make to make it into a home again, although it would be a lovely home. And that and, and we even uh, had that discussion, Kim, as well, this would be a lovely home, but you would need to obviously then turn it back around and that would come at a cost. So, yeah, definitely. I know that's the thing you can have it. I mean, it is, it's perfectly set up for a HMO. So I'm obviously it'll work well for us trying to find somebody else that is going to be a suitable fit for that style of property. But it is taking that into consideration when you are trying to find new tenants as well, if you can't let it under that licensing. But mm -hmm. one of the benefits for it is, is it does have that private garden out to the back. So um, yeah, which, yeah, which I did point out a few times and, and um, made sure that people were aware that the, the outside space that come with it, because it's, it's, it's very rare to find such um, a big outside space to come in a property right in the middle of St Andrews. Yeah, so centrally located. Yeah, like it's like in the town centre. <laughs> so, <yeah. laughs> so although you'll have a higher turnover of tenants, this will mean that you'll have more money and time spent on advertisement, referencing, inventories, check-ins, check-outs and agency fees. So although you've got obviously the property's compliance, you've also got all your general letting costs that you have to take into consideration as well with a high turnover of tenants. Let's talk about that for a wee bit because this, I don't think it just applies to HMOs. I think no. people- <laughs> This is um, all lets. <laughs> yes, with, generally with all lets. Like what did you say there? Obviously advertising, uh, yes, referencing got, fees, yeah. inventories, the check out the check in the check out, check out. Um, and obviously your, your management agency fees and everything as well so i mean people forget about all these things and these are all really important aspects of setting up a any let whether it's an hmo whether it's a res, just a long-term residential and it is really important to have the proper referencing done and have a proper inventory in place and and if you're you've got a good agent who's going to advertise it properly and and do video and do pictures and, and social media and things then you know, these are all, and so there's an advertising cost as well. And then the actual move in and, and the, the check in, and then obviously checking them out and making sure the property is done properly. And then the ongoing management as well. And <laughs> I don't think people really understand uh, how much actually goes into managing property. And, and it's not just because maybe we do, obviously, uh, we've got a, a, a bigger number of properties to look up. And even landlords who self manage themselves will understand even if they've just got one or two there's a lot goes into just those one or two properties so if you think of an agent who's managing two three four hundred at least at a time then their management fee is, is really it is necessary for them to operate and look after the property 
properly and keep it compliant and also keep themselves up with the legislation and compliance so that then they, they could advise you and, and manage the property and keep it um, compliant and in line with the current legislation as well. There's so much that goes into it. And I, I mean, Karen, you know this um, as, as you do lettings every day as well. Yes. That's the thing. It's not just keeping the property compliant, it's keeping it looked after, whether it's maintenance, arranging any work that's needing done, or if a tenant's maybe having some issues in it, it can make it so much easier having that agent. I spoke with a landlord just this week that um, was self-managing just to get, obtain a reference for a potential tenant. And he was like, I've had enough. <laughs> so it's just, and that was just two properties, but life is busy enough as it is. And it's just that impersonal side as well. So um, for example, if you have a tenant that's having issues with their boiler pressure and they don't understand how to top it up, it's hard for a landlord to turn around and say, that's fine. We'll, I'll get it topped up, but you'll get charged for it. Because yeah. obviously it is a basic tenant responsibility topping up the pressure on your boiler if it's needed. So um, for a managing agent, it's second nature to us, unfortunately. <laughs> so yeah, it's, yeah. it's something that we can do and it takes away that personal side of it as well. So I mean, for HMOs, if you've got multiple tenants in that property, you could potentially, I mean, it's for a start, it's going to cause a lot more wear and tear on your property, having yeah. one, that turnover, and two, that volume of people in the one property. So yeah. having to obviously make sure it's being looked after is something that I would highly advise. We still be doing regular inspections of it, make sure that property is being looked after, because you do have a lot of different people that are in there. So, And you can always get as well that friction, we'll say, from maybe some people yeah. not settling in quite well together, because it is ultimately just random people that are staying in a property together so maybe somebody doesn't want to do the dishes somebody else doesn't and then they end up sitting there for a week so it's all the or somebody doesn't want to hoover so nobody does it so it's all the even just general maintenance as well that I would advise still doing inspections if you do have HMO to make sure the basic household things are getting done because ultimately they should be but sometimes you don't always yeah. want to do the dishes. I, am, I, am. I mean obviously we know that managing property and things you do sometimes become a bit of a social worker and you know you could be like in that and mediation skills and everything i always talk about that but i've heard from uh, agents who deal with hmos and, and and they end up really involved and in, like right in the midst of like oh and it's uh, like situations where it's like oh he said this and she said this and i'm not doing that and it's like that that would be quite stressful i think when you're doing hmo to have that kind of level of um involvement and just like the the day-to-day -day things i i think there's a lot more micromanagement uh, off the building as opposed to what, what we do in long, longer term residential. A couple of things, you, you just to pick up on what you said there, you were talking about people not knowing how to do boiler pressures and just like the things that we take for, um, I think we become quite complacent in the fact, but it's easy to become quite complacent in the fact that you expect people to know these things and a lot of people don't. <laughs> do you know, and it's like, um, we, we obviously do it day in, day out and, and sometimes you, you forget yourself and think, right, wait a minute, you need to you need to educate these people in the beginning like this is how you do the pressure and it, like because they're not going to know this and a lot of people don't have some some of the like just basic life skills that you do need to operate your boiler and actually that one that we've got in st andrews has got two boilers yeah because we put the heating on and it was like why is it not coming on up here and i was like i bet there's another boiler so we were away hunting around and we found it it does it's got two boilers because it yeah. is it's such a big property so it runs off the two two boiler systems yeah yeah they were quite they were good i think they were both Worcester. i think yeah Worcester. and it came on quite quickly which is why we were investigating as to why the rest of the house wasn't <laughs> yeah and the other thing that you said you, you mentioned about the landlord you were speaking to i'm sure that's the one that you called me about the other day yeah, and he was sure. like i've had enough i'm done um, and it is something that we're seeing, and, and I, I spoke in the uh, midweek show with Perry and Jim, um, and we were talking about a lot of stats and figures and things relating to, like, the, the, the media and the press talking about this mass exodus of landlords and things and everybody leaving the sector. And as I said, I mean, there is, there is landlords that have got to that point in their individual circumstances have brought them to the realisation that I'm going to sell up, it's time for me to sell, it's maybe not uh, making me as much money or it's not as lucrative or I can't provide as good a home as I want to anymore because I don't have the, the, the income coming from them to keep the properties up to the standard that I want them to provide good houses for tenants. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of um, factors involved in that. But when I looked at the, when, when I looked at the stats and I, I relayed this on the show and now this is UK average. This, this is not just like Fife, but 
there was 150,000, I believe, homes sold um, last year, by the end of last financial year, which is April 2023, in the UK. So buy-to-let uh, like rental properties were sold. But then at the same time, there was 144,000 bought like by new investors and new landlords and things because and we and Karen, you know that we see quite a lot of new investors and, and things coming into the market every week and it's like near enough every day sometimes and it's like they're totally enthusiastic they're building portfolios they're providing really good quality homes so and in all honesty that that to me seems like a good balance i mean it's just the, the sign of the times for some people and maybe people that have been in it for a longer time and, and maybe not want to do a, a a really long-term investment and pass on to their kids and things that's that's their time to exit but at the same time we've got a lot of people coming in so don't believe the press <laughs> it's probably it's probably what i'm trying to put out there from that statement and and the stats do back that up i think it swings in roundabouts like ultimately you are going to have landlords that exit the market but at the same time you're going to have new landlords that come into the market so it is just making sure i mean the way the market is just now it's just it's still absolutely crazy like, yeah, I do yeah, not get a minute yeah. for looking at inquiries that are coming through for properties and it's just it is absolutely crazy but at the same time it's people are being more conscious about what they're spending mm -hmm. so oh, yeah. if we've got the right property on at the right price then they are still it's not staying on the market very long at all I mean we've had one I had one last week that was like agreed within two days mm -hmm. And then this week, I've had another one that will be like agreed within probably less than a week. So it's just if we've got the right one at the right price, they are still going really quickly. I was just going to say that to you. Do you find it's, it's reflective of the type of property or the price bracket that it's in? I'd say definitely. It, it's a bit of both, to be honest. Um, it, it depends on the area as well. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. ones that, that obviously certain areas demand quite high. I mean, the ones that we've let... One is uh, one's newly decorated with brand new carpets in it. It's all nice and fresh. So that obviously makes a difference. Yep. And uh, the one that was in two days, it's this lovely country house, basically. So um, it's it, they both very much have appeals to them. Whereas if we've got one that's maybe in a little bit of a rougher area or maybe need a bit of TLC, like people are coming in and they're not just last they're year. Not as in, they're not as keen and enthusiastic. Yeah. They're like, oh, we have to assign, basically. Yeah, so I mean, last year people were just taking anything they could, whereas this year I think people were seeing people are a lot more considerate as to what they're taking this year. So um, it is making sure that you've got your property in the right condition and at the right price, and it will still go quickly and you'll attract a good tenant, as opposed to it maybe needing a fresh coat of paint or just a wee bit of TLC to it. It does make a difference into the letting time for it. Yeah, there's definitely been a shift in, in the market, but I think there's still the demand still there mm -hmm. and you could still achieve really good rental prices and things but it does come down to how you actually do that and it's all about market and, and the property condition and and it's like it's like what we spoke about before i mean it's not even just down to the street it could actually change by property now like the individual property you could have a property at one end of the street different from the other one at the other end of the street and they could be more appealing and or achieve a better rental price and, and well, I mean, I've, had, I've had that before two properties next door to each other at the same time and literally the only differentiating, differentiating factors for them were um, one a slightly different coloured colour scheme of the kitchen and in the bathroom in the kitchen slightly different coloured flooring and that made the difference because mm -hmm. one of them lit a lot quicker than the other one and it wasn't to say the other one was bad it was just people's preference for the other colour of flooring that was in it the other type of flooring so, and they were literally same build, same layout. Everything was the same apart from those very small cosmetic differences. Was that, hey, I'm trying to think, that was that your new builds? That's the yeah, and garbage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, I was trying to think what ones you were referring to there, but that's crazy because they were they were basically the same home. Mm -hmm. um, but because of those slight differences, it, it was uh, one was more advantage, uh, took the advantage over the other, which is yeah. crazy because they are in essence the exact same. Um, so yeah, so back to uh, yeah drawbacks. What about furnishings and things at HMOs? So um, obviously when it comes to, it's not a legal requirement, but you are expected to provide furniture, all of which must comply with health and safety regulations and have the fire safety labels attached to them. So yeah, that's, that's a really important one. <laughs> um, fire safety labels and things are so important. You also, I mean, it, it depends if you're, you need to kind of, 
guide it to who your target audience is. So for instance, if you've got students, you're going to want to have a desk and a chair for them to sit and study at. And then generally you're going to have the bed and somewhere for them to put their clothes and things as well. Um, but then if you've got the, if it's maybe contractors, you're, you're guiding, uh, gearing it towards, then maybe a desk not necessary, but you're still going to have to have a wardrobe and things. And then, and then, and then you could start to then think about like, well, TVs and all the rest of it. I mean, you don't have to do that. But I think if you've got it set up uh, to appeal to your target audience, whether that's contractor, whether it's students, whether it's do you know what I mean, whether it's a lecturer or whatever, that's going to then let the the, the room a lot easier. I was going to say proper athletes have room. <laughs> Forget we're talking about HMOs. So and it's going to let it a lot easier because it's going to appeal to your your uh, your target. Yeah, and I think when it comes to HMOs, I mean the expectation is for them to be furnished. I wouldn't imagine having one that's not furnished. I mean, you might still get ones that are like, obviously rent a room, you have your own furniture for it, but I would say majority of the time, it does tend to be that they are furnished. Yeah, generally generally with uh, residential, we say unfurnished, but then as you head along like the East Nuke and into St Andrews, where it's like holiday let territory and things as well, there is a wee bit of an expectation when people rent, like longer term rents to have furnishings in place, just because of where it, cool. where it is. Yeah, the area, I mean, like we say, the East Nook, um, there is a bit more of a demand there for it to be furnished. So if we have a landlord that has one and they're not sure whether to do, I mean, it's it's completely up to themselves because there's a market for, for both types. Yeah. But I've had one, a furnished one just now in Pitt and Wien. So, um, and that's, I've had people asking, can they unfurnish it? And it's like, no, because <laughs> it's it's really <laughs> furnished. Yeah. But, um, we've got lovely uh, some lovely tenants that are now due to be going into that one so I've just updated that one to let you read today so um, yeah, so that'll be a nice home for somebody but it yeah, is, it's furnished and they were over the moon with it being furnished because it's a change of circumstances for them and it just means that they can just come and get settled in and they don't have to buy I mean even white goods, we have rentals that don't even have white goods in them which again it's, it's just potluck basically as to what property you're in if it has white goods or not so uh, I think generally if you've got the kitchen I think it's important to have probably have like an oven and a hob mm -hmm. but then when you start to go like fridge freezers and washing machines and things generally we would probably advise just leave them and let people get their own if it's like and like if you're in somewhere like um leaving mouth or Glen office or Kirkcaldy that's the expectation and then as you say east new things the more furnishings and things become like the expectation you just done a fully furnished one in Cooper Kern and it looks really nice and, and you let that quite quickly and that's got everything in it because it used to be a holiday let. Yes, so that was fully furnished. So they have kind of de taken some of the personalisation away yeah. from it just obviously so the tenants that are moving in can put their own pictures up and um, just like little bits and pieces and I'd advise them to take their plants out just so some people aren't very good at looking after plants in case they <laughs> kill them. <laughs> but she's like, I wasn't fussed, but they have like taken away some of the like more personal touches for it. So it was good beforehand because we got the pictures and I mean it looks lovely in the listing and it is lovely so um but obviously it's nice to have those little personal touches away for a tenant moving in so they do still although it's furnished they do still have the scope to put their own items in place and just give it their own homely touch to it and obviously it, it tends to make them last a bit longer out of a tenancy as well if someone feels at home in the property. Just out of curiosity because Cooper is a good area because it does still have like people it's close to St Andrews but it's, the price bracket's completely different and it also has a train station. So it does appeal to students and we have people that are working and things as well that come in there. Um, were they students or are they, what, what was their plan? Working professionals. Ah, so, and they still took furnished. That's mm -hmm. that's quite interesting then. So there you go. So that's it, like, you never know. It could, it doesn't always have to fall into a certain niche of people. Um, so yeah, but that, that's a bit into the furnishings and things as well. Because I mean, generally we would say, unfurnished but it just depends it just means there's less responsibility as well obviously we've covered it before but what you leave in the let is what you're responsible for as a landlord so if something breaks you have to replace it as like to like as you can so if you're leaving an expensive tv for example and it stops working your hand having to replace an expensive tv with the same as opposed to just something cheaper that you could put in but you have to replace it as like for like as you can yeah good so we talk about costs and obviously the HMOs maybe being a bit more lucrative and bringing in more profit and things, but there are some extra HMO operating costs that you need to think about as well. So as you might imagine, there are more costs to running an HMO 
than just a single tenancy property as well as the the having the shorter average stays as you said can there could be a bit more turnover and there's a wee bit extra admin in terms of paperwork and things as well there are some other additional costs to consider so although your rental income will more than likely be higher and that's that's probably obviously a given that that's going to be you will pay the utility bills and the council tax um, plus your tenants especially if they're students will expect to have broadband and not just that it'll have to be really good broadband so you're not going to have to i mean i think um is it talk talk or do you know something that's going to like drop in and out you're going to have to really have really good fiber optic uh, broadband for students or like i say if it's post postgrads or even if it's like lecturers and things they're going to need access to or even contractors or people that are working everybody needs it now yeah generally um, people just expect to have good well everyone benefits it's went from, from a luxury thing to a necessity yeah yeah, I think dishwashers are kind of edging their way into that as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, dishwashers are a luxury item still, in my opinion. Uh, yeah, we don't have too many rentals that have got dishwashers. No, so when no, I'm doing well, viewing, I'm like, this one has a dishwasher. Appreciate I have, it. Uh, <laughs> I have somebody say, oh, is there not a dishwasher? And I'm like, no. no. <laughs> There's the sinks over there at the window. <laughs> but, uh, but yes, I mean, as slowly becoming a wee bit of an expectation from people, but they were a long way off that with dishwashers. But Fast broadband internet connection is definitely one for people to operate if they're uh, for their work and just in general um, their personal day to day life. I mean, everybody needs good internet. So they are all things that you really need to remember to incorporate into your budget. Um, so think about utilities and council tax and and broadband costs and things as well. I think the um, utilities would put me off alone. Yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, obviously, if you've got a good uh, return coming through and yeah. you've got high occupancy and all your rooms filled, and if you if, obviously if you've got all your numbers right, then it shouldn't be a problem. Obviously, I think that's the key point, getting your numbers right yeah. to make it work for you. Yeah, I think it's obviously, and that's coming right back to even, I mean, if, if you've already got the property and you're converting it, then obviously look at the numbers. But even if you're thinking, right, I'm going to purchase this property, I'm going to make it an HMO and make lots of money. <laughs> that's not the way to think about it. I think you, you really need to think strategically about right the purchase price of this and how much it's going to cost me to make it into an HMO. Am I going to get the the uh, license to do that? Am I going to get the approval to do that? Am I going to have I got them set up to appeal to my target audience and have I got the and have I got the rental price right so that the return I'm going to get is going to cover all the costs to keep it running? Do you know what I mean? There's a lot to think about and having a good agent and uh, like I say a good mortgage broker and things like that on your side to advise you correctly is paramount. So with no tenant responsibilities for communal, communal areas, uh, you'll need to arrange and pay for regular, um, maybe like the gardening and things as well. Um, it is ideally get a cleaner in there, but like you say, Ken, it's good to get um, the, um, the the all the occupants on side and if they all do their bit, it makes it a lot easier. But obviously communal hallways and things um, and the external garden and things like the, the garden up at that one, you do need to have a gardener and something in place to to take care of that. I think that, yeah, garden, exactly. that one's quite nice and low maintenance. I think it just needs yeah. a bit of weeding now and again. So we've gone for the chips and slabs. So, but it's still a good bit of space to have and nice and low maintenance. The, the, to be fair, though, I, I mean it is a low maintenance garden, and it was. But when before the gardener was in the other weekend, I think it hadn't been touched for a while, and although it was all, it's all paved and chipped and things. It had become a wee bit overgrown, but I think it'd been left for a while. So uh, they're all things like if they're kept on top of, then they shouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, also, I think as as your property will be laid out to multiple tenants on 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 the, the, the individual tenancy agreements and things, you'll need to fit locks on every room that you rent out. Now, this is I think privacy is quite a, a big thing. You need to make sure that each individual has their own lock on their room and they've got their own security and their own privacy and feel safe in, the, in, in their room as well. That's a really important thing. Yeah, I think just to give you that privacy and like you say, that's a sense of security as well, because ultimately you could be living in a house with multiple strangers that you don't know. So having that safe space that you can have your privacy and your security in is obviously a, a key point for it. Yeah. Yeah, and I think if people are... are like, exploring the option of doing an HMO. I think on the upside, room rents have risen um, and the number of HMOs have, have started to increase across the country, not just obviously here. And then more letting agents and things have decided to start managing them. 
um, not us, <laughs> not yet anyway. Um, and then that gives people a lot more choice in terms of who you could entrust to actually look after and manage the building for you. Because to manage an HMO as a landlord on your own will be a lot of work. So have a really good agent who knows what they're doing. Um, I know a few locally um, that operate in St Andrews and things who are really good and have done it for years and, and they know what they're doing. Um, so, I mean, it, it will pay dividends to have the right people looking after it for you. And I have seen I have seen other agents uh, start to dip their toe into HMO and it has become a lot more um, of a common thing for agents to start exploring because landlords are now obviously turning their their uh, their views to HMOs because obviously, like I say, they're starting to think outside the box, things are changing, it's like, what could I do? And if you've got a big property and you think it's got potential to be an HMO, then it's worth exploring, definitely. Is it something you see a lot of, Karen, or? Um, I think, as you say, primarily in the St Andrews area, um, obviously it's something that landlords look to explore, just the fact that you've got the students there for it. And there are quite substantial houses up there as well. So um, obviously it does benefit them if you do have a student and it can be quite a lucrative return for it. But definitely making sure you're in the right market to do so. Obviously around here it is a lot of long-term lets uh, primarily that we have in the Fife area. So, um, but say St Andrews is different so yeah uh, St Andrews also I mean that they put the they put the uh, the ban on any new applications for HMOs and everything and that was in place and and also um if you are applying for an HMO in places like St Andrews then you're going to have you're going to have a wee bit of uproar from residents because I know that there's been a lot of opposition to certain ones uh, over the years and things I've, I've heard a few stories so, uh, and in some cases, the residents are right. In other cases, you might not agree. And it's just, it's one of the things that comes with dealing with HMOs, unfortunately, because residents will ultimately, uh, they'll just think, oh, I'm going to have a load of students next door to me. They're going to be partying all weekend or, do you know what I mean? And it's not always like that, but obviously you run, there is a risk of that kind of being the eventuality uh, if the wrong people are put in place as well. So, I mean, it's, it's fine if you've got such a, in an area like Sanders where you've got such a high demand for students, you could you could really pick all the best ones. But then it's then you think, God, well, where does all the rest of them go? Totally displaces them. And if last year we've seen a lot of that, and we had mm -hmm. uh, we had stories that there were students having to board in Dundee and then travel, which isn't too bad. And then some that were having to actually postpone their studies completely because there was just not enough accommodation, and they were having to roll it on to this year. Well, that was last year. Um, but then that's going to have a knock-on effect as well because they're, then they're going to be coming back this year on top of the, all the other students and then so some of them are going to have to then postpone their studies to the following year and that's just going to have a continual knock-on effect in my opinion so something needs to be obviously done about that so and 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 as we know from the inquiries we've had recently there is a lot of students looking for lets in the St Andrews area at the moment so any final thoughts Kim? I think if you are looking to venture into HMOs, obviously check the regulations surrounding it. Make sure that you are, one, getting a property in the right area, that there is a demand for it, and two, that you'll actually get a HMO licence if the property that you're potentially purchasing doesn't already have one in place. Yeah, definitely. So, I mean, if you do, if you do have a property and you're wondering, is owning maybe an HMO right for you, feel free, come back to me. I put my direct number and my email address in the blog attached to the post, feel free to come to me and I will give you any advice I can or point you in the right direction of somebody that uh, can advise you and whether that is a mortgage advisor, if it's a good insurance broker or even just if you want in general some feedback on um, HMOs in general. Now we don't operate HMOs but I do have a lot of um, insight into how they, they work and I know a lot of good agents who could, um, could help you do that if it's something that you're, you're considering as an option. And that's us, Kim. So thanks very much for joining me. Thanks very much, everybody, for watching. And as I say, any questions, you could pop them in to me directly or put them in the comments if you're watching this on the rerun. And um, I'll come back to you as best I can. And until next time, I'll see you later. Bye.